our, our next hot topic speaker is a local uh, from JQI, uh, right here. Um, Phil Risherm, who will uh, talk to us about trapped ion quantum simulation. Okay, and so first I would like to also thank Gretchen and Trey for putting together such an enjoyable and engaging conference, and also for inviting me here to tell you about some of the recent progress that we've realized in Chris Monroe's quantum simulation lab at the Joint Quantum Institute. And in our latest work, what we've really realized is that um, ions are, of course, an excellent isolated quantum system. We can deterministically prepare them in known states. We can let them evolve under the Schrodinger equation with essentially no decoherence over experimentally interesting timescales. And at the end of all of it, we can read out with nearly perfect efficiency. And so what this allows us to do is to take the dynamics of some hard to describe uh, coupled quantum many body system and encode those dynamics onto some well-controlled quantum system that we can actually build in a physical system in a laboratory. And to give you a flavor of why this is really kind of an interesting thing to do, I want you to consider a, um, a spin chain, spin half particles and there are n of them. And each of these spins can take on either an up or down spin configuration, something like this. This is another valid configuration. And in general, there are about two to the n different configurations that the spin chain can take on. And now since this is quantum mechanics, uh, we can actually be in a coherent superposition of any or all of these different configurations. And so if we wanted to actually write down the wave function at a particular time, this requires keeping track of two to the n different complex numbers to fill out this, this wave function. And as a point of reference, if you have only 32 spins in your system, and this requires 32 gigabytes of RAM just to write down the state of the system at a particular time, and that's easily more RAM that's in probably any laptop in this room right now. The situation gets even a little bit more complicated if you want to say, we know that the state of the system is, is, is this psi at T1. What is the state of the system at some later time, T2? Uh, typically, this requires you to create some uh, unitary evolution operator. This is a matrix with dimensions 2 to the n by 2 to the n. And this entire method breaks down very easily once you get above about 30 spins or so. Now, I should immediately add that in certain situations, you can use some approximation methods like DMRG or matrix product states to uh, push beyond 30 spins or so. Uh, but as Feynman quite rightly pointed out several uh, decades ago, the world is inherently quantum. And if you want to describe the behavior of these large quantum systems at some point, you need to encode that into the exponentially growing Hilbert space of another quantum system. So this gives us a roadmap for building our experiments as long, along with a, an outline for this talk. So we'll start um, by uh, telling you how we actually go about building an isolated quantum, quantum many body system in our lab, what we do to control it and verify that it's working as we expect, and finally how we can use it to study dynamics and evolution under the Schrodinger equation. So on to step one, how we build an isolated quantum many body system. Uh, we're ion trappers, and so we start by loading ytterbium 171 ions into an RF Paul trap. The ions are spaced by about two microns or so, and uh, here you can see 16 of them loaded into our trap. If you zoom down way into the ground state um, electronic structure of ytterbium, uh, you find that you have these two hyperfine states here. Uh, we label them up and down, and they're split by about 12.6 gigahertz and relatively insensitive to external magnetic fields. And what that does for us is gives us very long qubit coherence times of a few seconds without having to worry about any magnetic shielding around our trap apparatus. When it comes time to detect whether or not this qubit is in the state up or down, we can use a spin-dependent fluorescence technique whereby we couple in 370 nanometer light onto our ions. If the ions are in the state up, then it absorbs that 370 nanometer light and decays back down and, and gives us a cycling transition. We can collect those photons onto a CCD camera and have site-resolved imaging of all of the ions. Now, if the ion is in the, in the spin state down, then this 370 nanometer light is no longer resonant with any of the transitions, and we scatter effectively zero photons onto our camera. So we have very, very excellent state discrimination between up and down. Now, just putting ions in a trap is not enough to make a many-body type spin system. What we need to do is figure out a way to generate spin-spin couplings between all of the ions. And there have been a, a variety of different theoretical proposals of how to do this, but in general, they all are focused on this idea that you want to couple the electronic degrees of freedom inside of your ions to the collective motional modes along all of the chain and use those motional modes to share that quantum information. And so the way that we go about this is we irradiate the ions with two counterpropagating laser beams. One beam we have at frequency omega, the other beam we have at frequency omega, plus that hyperfine splitting of 12.6 gigahertz, um, plus and minus an additional detuning mu. 
And since these ions live in a harmonic trap, they also exhibit these transverse modes of motion in the trap. And if we set these, these symmetric detunings mu to couple to these transverse modes of motion, uh, then when you work through all of the math, you can show that you end up with an Ising type interaction, a spin-spin interaction, sigma x on i on i, sigma x on i on j. And the strength of that interaction is parameterized by the spin-spin coupling of j i j, typically of order a few hundred hertz to a kilohertz or so for our strongest couplings. Recently, we've also devised, uh, devised a way to realize a dynamic version of an XY type Hamiltonian and let the system evolve under uh, this type of model as well. Here it's an XY Hamiltonian because we now have spin-spin couplings along two different directions of the block sphere simultaneously. It's important to point out that these JIJ spin-spin couplings have a particular structure to them. And namely, that structure is that they fall off with some sort of a power law decay uh, in distance between the two ions. And just by changing the laser frequency of these uh, symmetric beat notes here, uh, we can actually tune what this power law decay is in an ion trap, uh, in general, all the way from 1 over r to the 0, an all to all type coupling, to 1 over r cubed, which is a dipole-like approximation. So that's the theory, at least. But now we actually want to make sure that the Hamiltonian that the, I, that the ions are seeing is actually the one that we think that we're applying to them. And so if this were a, an atomic level structure question, uh, what we would do is perform spectroscopy, and we would then compare the Hamiltonian that we think the ion, that the atom has to uh, what we would calculate, and then we'd go into the lab and measure it. And here it's no different. Uh, we've actually come up with a many-body equivalent of a spectroscopy technique uh, for verifying these types of Ising couplings. So consider a chain of ions. They're all in the spin state down here. And then I want to ask the question of how much energy it takes to, um, for instance, flip that one spin on the end. Now, this change in energy, we can actually um, drive the spin-flip transition induced spectroscopy uh, just by putting on a transverse field that doesn't commute with these Ising couplings. And this transverse field is modulated at some frequency omega. And just like the spectroscopy we're all used to, if you modulate this frequency um, at the resonant energy splitting between these two states, then you can drive population from one state into the other state. And so this is the experiment that we do. Uh, when we modulate this drive frequency omega, we can trace out a very nice resonance, finding uh, what the probability of, 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 of ending in this one spin-flip state is as a function of frequency. And we can compare it to theory and find really excellent agreement. Now, we don't have to stop there. Uh, when we realize that the energy that it costs to flip this one spin on the end is actually a sum of all of the different spin-spin coupling terms in our Hamiltonian. And so if we make enough different energy measurements by flipping all of these different other types of spins in the system as well, uh, we can actually get enough, ener enough uh, energy terms to back out what all of these different spin-spin couplings must have been. And when we do that, we verify that we do have indeed these power law type decays in our system, and also that we have this tunable knob uh, to change what the range of those interactions was in our system. OK, so I've given you a little bit of the flavor of how we might go about building an isolated quantum system and what we can do to try and control and verify its behavior. And now I want to use it to study this type of Schrodinger evolution in our system. And one of the first questions that we asked um, is, how fast can quantum inf information spread when you have a closed quantum system? Now, this is a question that was originally thought of and, and really, really explored deeply by Lieb and Robinson uh, back in the 70s, and they considered short-range interacting systems, one with only nearest neighbor type interactions. And what they found is that um, you have a linear light cone for quantum information propagation. So in particular, if you start with, let's say, some excitation at one end of the chain, then as you go forward in time, the news of that excitation can travel, and it travels along the chain at some constant velocity. And just like the light cones that we're used to from special relativity, anything that's outside way over here doesn't have any information about the excitations that have been going on on this side of the system. And this has actually led to a bit of a revolution in condensed matter physics. And a number of very important theories have been proven based on the existence of these Lee robinson type bounds. So for instance, you can bound how quickly entanglement grows in a quantum many-body system. It tells you something about how difficult the system might be to classically simulate. And it also tells you how quickly the two different sides of a quantum system might come into thermal equilibrium with each other. And it constrains those time scales as well. Now, I should also mention that this type of experiment with uh, nearest neighbor couplings has been uh, realized in the lab by Emmanuel Bloch's group a few years ago. And here, too, you can see that they have this linear propagation of correlations uh, in, this, in, this, in this system. 
but left unanswered so far by experiments and, and Lee Robinson type theory is what happens to long range interacting systems. Certainly there are a variety of different important long range interacting systems in nature, but the Lee Robinson theory is never really developed to, to answer what happens when you go away, away from just the nearest neighbor case. Um, and so as also, because of the fact that there are rarely analytic solutions, uh, it's not entirely clear what happens to this light cone edge. Does it stay just as linear, unchanged? Does it stay linear but at a faster velocity, or does this bend over? And so not surprisingly, to answer these questions, there's been a lot of recent theoretical interest uh, trying to uh, answer some of those questions. And it's not just theoretical interest. Uh, in addition to our group, there's also been another experimental report out of Reiner Blatt's group in Innsbruck. Uh, here in this experiment, they look to make a local excitation right at the center of the chain, and they watch as that, excita as that excitation spreads through their system. Uh, in white here is the uh, kind of the velocity that you would expect from application, a naive application of a Lee Robinson type theory. And nonetheless, what they find is that correlations are actually reaching parts of the system faster than a Lee Robinson bound might. Uh, might tell you it should get there. And so really it's these long range interacting um, couplings that are in these systems uh, that allow these, these kinds of faster than linear communication between different parts of the chain. Okay, so now what we did in our experiment, uh, rather than, than accessing a site locally, uh, we implemented a global quench, which means we actually made excitation, excitations on every single site of the lattice. Uh, to do this, we started by initializing all of our spins along the down direction Z on the block sphere. Next, we suddenly turned on a long range Ising Hamiltonian or a long range uh, XY Hamiltonian at t equals zero. And then we let the system evolve for a particular amount of time. After some time, we made a projective measurement along the Z direction and, and found out what the spin order was. And after repeating those experiments many thousands of times to build up statistics, we were able to calculate what the correlation function uh, was, the connected correlation function uh, for the system at particular times. So when we actually do the experiment, here's the type of data that we get. What I'm plotting here is the connected correlation function between the leftmost ion on the chain and every other ion in the chain. And so we notice that at short times, uh, there's a nearest neighbor coupling correlation that, that springs up at first followed by uh, a correlation between the second nearest neighbors, followed by the third and fourth and fifth and so on nearest neighbors in the chain. If you ask at what, at what time does the correlation reach about 10% of its maximum value and you connect all of those times together, then you can come up with an effective light cone boundary for the system. And we find here very clearly that this boundary uh, curves away from linear. Uh, the linear behavior is what you would expect from a Lee Robinson nearest neighbor type system, uh, but because we have a long range interacting system, we have a causal region here that's actually accelerating in growth in time. We can take that experiment and compare it to the theoretical calculation of what you might expect, and here we find really excellent agreement between the two. Now I'm often asked, why is it that at late times these correlations start to die away? And to answer that question, we really have to make reference to the exact solution, which uh, is one of those rare examples for the Ising model only that an exact solution exists. And so in this exact solution for the Ising model, it's a re relatively ugly equation. Uh, but what I want to point out here is that it's made of all of these products of cosines whose arguments depend on these JIJ spin-spin coupling constants. And because these JIJs are all incommensurate with each other, then these products of cosines lead to a dephasing in this spin-spin coupling, which causes them to all uh, sort of separate and lead to kind of an averaged out zero correlation at later times. Uh, you might expect, because we have a finite size system, that at very long times you would have a partial revival in the spin-spin correlations. And that's actually exactly what we see if you go out way to, uh, to, to about 10 times what I've plotted here. And so the system is actually really remaining uh, effectively decoherence free over all of the times necessary to extract what these light cone boundaries are in the system. So I've showed you this data before. We can extract what the boundary here looks like for this, this, this light cone edge. Um, we can turn this boundary on the side and be a little bit more quantitative, add error bars to it and find that really it is moving faster than linear. And if we have the distance that these correlations have traveled as a function of time, we can also then calculate what the velocity of those correlation uh, propagation is as a function of time. And in particular, we can then compare that velocity to what you would calculate if you had an equivalent nearest neighbor only system, what would the Lieb Robinson bound give you? And for again, this very long range interacting system, uh, we find that the velocities are, are larger than the Lieb Robinson velocity. And this tells you already that 
um, all of the results that came from Lee Robinson theory, namely the bounds on entanglement propagation or how quickly quantum systems can thermalize, uh, none of those can be really trusted anymore since we're, uh, we're going beyond Lee Robinson physics here. We can also repeat these types of experiments for shorter and shorter and shorter range interactions. And what you notice is that the correlations in all cases as we move to shorter range interactions don't propagate uh, as strongly and nor, nor do they propagate as far. In our shortest range case, we have kind of a die-off of correlations after only about five sites or so. And this is getting towards that limit that um, for a perfectly short range interaction, the Ising model actually doesn't contain any flip-flop terms in its Hamiltonian, and so the correlation shouldn't propagate at all for a nearest neighbor only model. Now, that's, that's not true for an XY model where you do have flip-flop terms inherent in the Hamiltonian. And as a result, for all of our different interaction ranges, you have correlations that spread from one end of the system to the other. Also, I'll point out that uh, in the XY model, you also have faster than linear light cone growth in all of these cases. And particularly for this short range interaction here where the, uh, this alpha parameter characterizing the uh, power law decay, um, particularly when this alpha is greater than the dimensionality of the system, it was an open theoretical question as to what the shape of this boundary would be. Would it be linear or would it be uh, curving away? Uh, we find that it curves away and we've actually then checked this result numerically by uh, evolving the, the Schrodinger equation numerically. And what we find is the, uh, the data in blue and red for uh, nearest neighbor and 10th nearest neighbor correlations at the two ends of the chain. And then the solid curves are actually a zero parameter fit theory that comes directly out of the exact diagonalization of solving the Schrodinger equation. And we find really excellent agreement in these cases. One final thing that we can do is um, look at fixed values of time. How do the correlations die out as a function of distance, particularly outside of the light cone? When we do this, we can um, actually look at all of the data and found, find that all of the data fits quite nicely to exponential fits. And this agrees well with some of the recent theoretical work that's come out of Alexei Gorshkov's group at JQI, where they found that you should have an exponential fit um, coming out of the data beyond the light cone, uh, which eventually should transition to a power law sort of decay when the correlations get very, very tiny. I'll also point out that if you naively just wanted to calculate what these correlations should be using a, a perturbative uh, theory, then you find that the uh, perturbation theory agrees well at short times, but as you move to longer and longer times, uh, the perturbation result completely misses the data uh, entirely. Uh, so that, that perturbation theory fails at later evolution times because really what the shape of this light cone is driven by is, is uh, quasi-particles that are emitted on all of these different sites. There are excitations on every side of the lattice. They can have multiple different hopping processes, and they all have to quantum interfere with each other. And that entire process, uh, what makes it so difficult and so, uh, so time-consuming to calculate on a classical computer, uh, that behavior is coming directly out of our, our simulation here. So we're really capturing these, these non-trivial long-time dynamics. Now, since this is a hot topic session, I want to use the last two minutes of my talk or so to, to discuss a particularly hot topic in our lab right now, which is simulations of spin systems of higher dimensionality than just spin half. So I've showed you already how we can encode a spin half qubit in the, uh, in the ground state structure of, of Ethereum, but we can also use the Zeeman levels here and encode three different states using the minus, zero, and plus states here in Ethereum. And using a laser configuration that's not so different than the ones that I've shown you before, uh, we can actually realize this native XY type Hamiltonian where now we have flip-flop operators, SI plus, SJ minus in the Hermitian conjugate uh, that act all throughout the spin one manifold. And as before, we have these JIJ spin-spin couplings that fall off with a power law and distance and we can tune that power law. And so if you want to consider the case of starting with just two Q trits now, if we start them in this state, 0, 0, then under application of this XY type Hamiltonian, 0, 0 should be driven to a coherent superposition of plus minus and minus plus as a function of time and then flop back to 0, 0. And when we do the experiment, that's exactly what we find. We're starting in the 0, 0 state with 100% probability. We're oscillating back and forth and we're trading off population between 0, 0 and a coherent superposition of minus plus and plus minus. How do I know that it's a coherent superposition? Well, we can go to this time in the time evolution and we can perform a parity measurement on the minus plus and plus minus states. And the excellent contrast that we see in this parity measurement certifies that we have an entangled state at that point with an entanglement fidelity of 86%. 
Now we can even go a step further and add additional terms to this long range XY type Hamiltonian, like a D uh, sum of SZ squared type term. If we start the system in the ground state of this Hamiltonian with D very, very large, and then we adiabatically ramp down this D term, then we actually should end up in the ground state of this long range XY model. And we're very excited about this because we have some early theoretical indications that the ground states of long range XY models uh, in the spin one system should show some character of a Haldane phase, which is a, a really, really interesting condensed matter type construct as well as something that's, that's a very hot topic for people who talk about topological quantum computing. Okay, and so with that, I just want to um, conclude by thanking all of my collaborators in the Monroe, Monroe Lab, particularly those who were listed in red who most directly contributed to these experiments. And I will leave you with a summary slide showing all of our recent results. Thank you. Great talk and great timing. So we have time for a few questions. So for the Haldane chain, usually you, you need Heisenberg couplings. So why, what does it mean to have Haldane-like or Haldane character? I mean, and what are the prospects of realizing full Heisenberg couplings in the system? And that, the second question I like <laughs> to ask, in the quasi-particles when you do the global quench, does that include, when you have these emissions on many light cones, does that include the simulation, also measurement interactions between the quasi-particles, or are they considered to be ballistic and independent? Okay, I'll, ask, I'll answer your first question, your second question first. I'd say, I'd say that we don't consider the quasi-particles to be ballistic. I think it really does um, require one to look at all of the different interferences and interactions between the quasi-particles that are emitted on all of the different sites. I think if they were ballistic, then that should come out in some sort of a, a perturbation theory type treatment, and that's not what we're seeing in the experiments. Um, as to your first question with the Haldane phase, you're absolutely right that, that typically it's, it's thought about in a Heisenberg type coupling. We have some ideas about how to actually realize a native Heisenberg type interaction in the spin one system. Um, where this is, this, is, this is relative, what I've said here about the XY model also realizing it. Um, the, the kind of signature that we're looking for here is that there just is some gap above the ground state. And I'm told by our theorist collaborators that this is what you see in a long range XY model as you move to a larger and larger uh, number of particles in our, in our system. We should have more numerics later on and we you know, clearly have to scale the system size up to be able to realize such a thing, uh, but I think this is possible. Is this working? Okay. I have a simple question. Um, just to, if you could give more intuition on why the entanglement speed actually speeds up. My intuition tells me that if, if you, you make a wave, it goes a constant speed, and then it may interfere with waves later, but, but sort of the one piece just runs out in front. Mm -hmm. Why is that bad intuition? It's not bad intuition. I think it's very good intuition. I think it's a, it, it was a bit of a surprise for me, too, uh, to see that these things can be speeding up in time. Uh, now, maybe let me back up just a little bit and say that um, if, you, if you look at, at just a plot like this, like I have it here, if you have a long-range coupling uh, between... Um, let's say one ion on one end of the chain and one ion all the way at the other end of the chain, and that coupling is so long range that it's longer than the dimensionality of the system. If you ask at what time it takes for, for this end of the system to become coupled with that end of the system, um, it's almost instantaneous. And in the absolute limit that all of the ions are coupled to all of the other ions with an equal strength, um, then you can kind of imagine that as soon as you start the system off, then the two ends that could be in principle infinitely far apart are automatically coupled infinitely far being still obeying special relativity bounds on how quickly light can travel. Okay, and so by that sense, um, the velocity is really approaching this infinite limit as you go to a longer and longer range interaction. So just following up on that, on that previous question, you, 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 you made the point that in fact, of course, these interactions are uh, are effectively instantaneous because they are, they're, they're electromagnetic, whereas the thing you call light cone is really a sound cone. And, uh, and so the question is why uh, do you have things that are going faster than, than sound? But if, if I've understood correctly, when you say what is the, the sound velocity, the, the thing that's called the light velocity here, you're, you're evaluating that 
in um, an approximation that says I'm only going to consider the, the next nearest neighbors. Is that right? I mean, in order in order to to um, see what the Lieb Robinson bound yes. is. Yes, and so to compare it to the Lieb Robinson bound, what we're doing is we're saying let's look at the strongest spin spin coupling in our system, and then let's ask if that were only a nearest neighbor interaction, how quickly would the Lieb Robinson light cone go out? How right. quickly would those velocities okay, so go that, out? Okay, so that gives you what the sound velocity is, but it's clear that if you've got other interactions, mm -hmm. which of course you do, that's then then you could imagine things going out a lot faster. But, exactly. But, but now to return again, mm -hmm. why does it accelerate? That is, it tells you why you can have things happen quickly, mm -hmm. but it doesn't exactly give you a feeling for why things um, uh, evolve in that accelerating way as, as time goes on. That's right. And I, I completely agree with that. And I think, um, for me, without an analytic solution to really describe the dynamics of what's going on here, it's really hard to gain intuition. I think <laughs> all of these things have to come back to either numerical or simulation type methods to, um, to point us in the right direction of knowing how to build that intuition uh, to really see what goes on. But without an analytic solution, I can't look at an equation or, or then extract um, a coherent argument as to why this should be the case. It's just what we observe and, and, and we're um, certainly investigating it as a hot topic. Uh, how do the make the cyclic phase of ground states of a spin one system and uh, non-protonist modes of excitation, excitation of a spin one system? You know, in the spin one system, there are three ground states, filamentant, right. artifilamentant, and uh, mm -hmm. cyclic phase, cyclic phase. And uh, there are two different types the citation, one is Japanese, another is type. Mm -hmm. it's so I, I would say, I would say that we don't yeah. yet have a large enough system that we can actually um, start measuring what those gaps are as a function of the, of the different phases of a coherent superposition that we get at the ends of these types of simulations. Uh, we, can, we can go steps further and actually take a look at, at doing parity type measurements um, that are actually sensitive to bringing out what the uh, phase relationships are between all of the different um, components of the eigenstate. And when we do that, we find that the phases actually align with what you might expect for, uh, for these small systems that we can still diagonalize exactly and calculate. So we verified that and we found them to all agree. Okay. Is there any other short question? Oh, okay. This is the last one. Excuse me, I'm wondering, do you have like any uh, literature in your system and if you have, how would you control it? I'm sorry, any what? Uh, leakage error due to of interaction of system with environment. Uh, leakage oh. error. Oh, leakage error. Um, I would say that, that spontaneous emission for ions is typically the, the leakage error that most people are worried about. But we've actually chosen a laser frequency that is kind of at this magic point where spontaneous emission is, is quite well minimized. And I'd say in our experiments, it's so small that it's, it's, it's hardly the biggest error at all. We don't even think about it or see it. <laughs> for a great talk. Next.